determination to get others to see what, what he sees and then follow through with action. You've paid a, a terrible price for your convictions, but when you think about it has truly made a difference in the world. I hope that if you have not seen the, the film, please do check out The Island President. But that's, that's just a glimpse of what this distinguished human being <laughs> has achieved and is achieving through example. And people ask me so often, what can I as an individual do? Well, one way to answer that question is look at what one individual here or there, you know, there are individuals who, by example, have given inspiration to everyone. And President Nasheed, you certainly shine in that category. So that's what I want to say <laughs> for my few words of introduction. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, too kind, ma'am. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, we would like your questions, um, and we would try to answer the best of our ability. Um, and at also at the same time, try to see if we are able to get the message across. But we all know that you are believers. Um, but the idea here is to see how we may be able to convince non-believers uh, what is the best way forward to get the environment issue into the mainstream. Very often um, these issues are in the periphery, in the margins. So how do, you, how do we take it to the mainstream? Um, I feel that uh, we very often take the environment issues or have the climate change issue and the ocean issue as an earth science, just an earth science issue. But I feel that if we are able to articulate this as an economic issue, as much as it is a human rights issue, then we are able to spread the message far quicker um, than just living in the margins. Um, we are not abnormal people. We are just very normal people um, trying to do normal things. Um, so we are hoping that other normal people would also try and understand the impact, the effects that the environment is having on them. Um, so um, please raise your questions. And again and again, um, if there ever is a person with a lifetime award on the environment, um, it is Sylvia Earle. And I sit in a jury in Zaid Foundation in Abu Dhabi. We give lifetime awards to politicians. Um, but very often politicians can articulate anything. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the lifetime is spent on the message. Um, but here, um, larger than life, um, Madam Sylvia is a lifetime achiever, um, and she certainly has changed our lives. Uh, she has brought the message to us, and we will never be able to... Um, award her enough um, in our words and in our deeds either. Um, thank you very much, ma'am. So are there questions? If not, I have some. <laughs> Look at this quiet audience. Oh, there's someone. Mr. President? Her, our deepness. Aside from the island president and Mission Blue, of course, and the books you guys have authored, I'm wondering what movies or books offer you ocean inspiration or environmental inspiration 
that are other books or films that we could share with people who are interested in learning more about the ocean fields? I think the options are really mind-boggling right now. You, when I think of the films that are available, thanks to many of the people who have assembled here in St. Petersburg, uh, from the BBC, from the National Geographic, I think of David Hannon, who, one person alone, who has stood up with the ability to document what goes on, the secret lives of the creatures who live in the sea, and then share the view. Uh, things that were not available when I was a child that now anyone can access and see the world with new eyes. So, you know, I, I can give some specific examples, but, you know, it's almost a, anything I could say would be a drop in a very big ocean of options that now are out there. I mean, I, I love the, the writers of the past, William Beebe still inspires me. I still dive into Half Mile Down and see the world as Beebe saw it back in the 1930s. I love looking at that little book. Well, it's a source of inspiration and despair. You may not know it, but maybe you do. It's called From Eden to Sahara about Florida written by a botanist in 1922 with images of Pinellas County that show before and after. He saw his Eden turn into what he thought was a Sahara. Then I came along more than, you know, in the 40s and 50s, and I saw my Eden turn into a very changed world. And people who come now see the continued loss. So it's looking, finding those sources. Oh, I love Archie Carr's writings. He is gone, but he lives on through his writings. And he's such a charismatic guy. He loved turtles, but he loved every bit of nature. You should read his life in Florida as a naturalist, chasing down gopher tortoises, trying to catch up with them. Can you imagine a gopher tortoise that can outrun Archie Carr? <laughs> The very thought of it just boggles my mind, but often the tortoise won, diving into his burrow, and then Archie would dig in there trying to get to that tortoise. Anyway, so I would love, you know, there has to be a place where the internet is a great place to share. You find a great book that inspires you, you know, celebrate it and pass it along. Get people to see. Again, if you, you find a, a really, something that touches you, let the world know. And tell them about what you've seen here that resonates. Share the view. Any thoughts on that? Um, I read odd books. Um, I've often found, um, just recently read a book by a gentleman called Ian Morris, but it's called Why the West is Ruling. Um, I read the book as Why Have We Done This to the Planet? Um, but it is a pattern of history. <clears throat> it, it, talks a lot of <clears throat> it talks a lot about climate change from the first ice age to coming up to now. And uh, the impact that the planet has taken throughout its own history. Um, so I would recommend um, in, in Morris's book, I don't know what he would feel when I say this, um, I would recommend his book uh, to understand why we are here. Um, I also recently read a book called Ascent of Money. Um, again, uh, um, uh, I kind of relate that to uh, how we've done this to the planet. Um, uh, um, so you, I, would, I would recommend people to read multidisciplinary subjects and books. Uh, I would like economic books read and then try to relate. Um, I'm re now reading uh, a book called Capital. It's a huge book, uh, difficult to read, 
Um, but I think uh, it has so much relevance, again, um, to why we are at this point now. Um, of course, her book, um, you would all would have seen it. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's these little things, how you relate that to why we are here and, and why we've done this to the planet. I think that's important to understand. Anybody here read Carl Hyacin's books? <laughs> yeah. It helps to laugh at yourself. And when you see people doing stupid things, to uh, poke fun at them, but never fail to poke fun at yourself. Uh, how about Sherman's Lagoon? <laughs> I forgot Ben Elton um, in the 80s had a novel called The Stark. That, I think, was one of my, first, one of the, my very first uh, big environment novels. What was it called? Stark. S-T-A-R-K. Stark. Check it out. I will. It sounds in, in, enticing. <laughs> Silent Spring. And ten years before that, she wrote the world around us, the sea around us. What's m remarkable about Rachel Carson's Sea Around Us, published in 1951, Silent Spring was 61, was her perception, the rest of the world's perception as well, that we had done such dastardly things to the land, but the ocean, the ocean was just too big, that we couldn't harm the sea as we had the land. Well, 50 years later, we knew better. And now, you know, it's 70, 50, 60. <laughs> yeah, it's, we now know that the world, even the ocean, is not too big to fail. But we, that's what is special about the present time. Now we know what even Rachel Carson couldn't see with her very um, great perception and her knowledge of the ocean wasn't that long ago. So that, that's really important to look at the way we used to think and the way we now can think. But the thing is that many of the policies that we now live by were put in place 50 or 60 or 70 or 100 years ago when we thought that nature was there to be used. And here we are using up much of the natural assets you know, when our numbers were small, we could get away with some of the actions. But today, I mean, just try to find a river that does not have a dam upon it. Most of them <laughs> have been manipulated in some serious way. You know, the rivers that are like the lifeblood of the land. You know, we need to figure out how to think differently about the natural world. Um, I'm over here. Psst, psst. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. President... Dr. Earl, I have two questions, one for each of you. Um, Mr. President, when we, we spoke yesterday briefly, and of course I said, you know, please run for Florida governor. We had a, and I, and I wish you could, and I hope you can in the future. Um, what do you, it's challenging for people that are um, passionate to go into being a policymaker or into politics. Um, so what would those criteria be that you could recommend to everyone so we can bridge this gap? Because here in the United States, we have really career politicians and those that are so much into that paradigm. And I think that one of the important things that we need, and particularly in the state of Florida, is for those mavericks to come out. But many people are shy. Many people are afraid to go into the system and, because it may dilute their integrity. Now, the second question for Sylvia, I've asked this before. I have all my gear. I live on the water. I have all my teeth. Will you go out with me? I'm sorry, I missed the, I missed the punchline. Do I have, I have to get on a knee now, don't I? Would you like to go out on a date with me? Would you, would you like to go out? Oh. <laughs> well, it depends on where. <laughs> Oh, 
don't want to go there. Um, I, I would pick Aquarius, but it has, <laughs> but we need candlelight, so maybe bioluminescence. Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> dive, dive, dive into a dark bioluminescent ocean. Well, okay, um, your question to me was, um, Um, how do we get the Mavericks out? And how do we get them to seek elections? Um, why I sought election was very strange because I thought that that would stop me from getting arrested. Uh, I was getting arrested all the time um, for writing and speaking. And then I thought maybe if I got elected, uh, they might think twice before they did that. Uh, but they, that didn't happen. Um, I, I was elected as an MP um, in 1999. And then I was only able to be in office for one year. So that, of course, is not how you get people out. Just, just before this meeting here, uh, there was another talk, and there was a gentleman, um, David. No, sorry, I, I, I didn't get his name, but he's running an organization that is backing politicians who are environmentally conscious. Um, so I think um, environmentalists, scientists, must come into politics. Uh, in the past, we thought that um, when we have a, a fact given to us, to politicians, then you consider that and make your policy with that fact as the central issue. But now self-interest, but even not, not necessarily now, but I, I believe self-interest would always drive policy more than a fact. So I, I would assume, uh, and I would think, that you would therefore should be looking at the self-interest. So the fact must come out in relation to that self-interest, which is very often the profit motive. So we must make protecting the environment attractive for profit motive. So that's why... I, I saw a, a, a lady, I think she's here, uh, asking a very solid economic question on the environment. Uh, uh, so I think uh, these kind of multidiscipline issues must come into politics. And if you want to have a legislation, perhaps you should bar political science students from contesting elections. Um, but then, you know, we are in Florida, and I'll go lost here. Um, but you tempered with it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the answer to your, my answer to your question would be uh, to, to seek out scientists and see, that, see how you, we may be able to push them to its office. Here. You've got so, your answer. <laughs> very short answer. <Yeah. laughs> Depends on where. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Nazir Ahmed, Fulbright scholar from Pakistan, visiting scholar here. And first of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Sylvia and all the team members which produce such a wonderful film on nature, one of the best film, I think so. And first of all, I congratulate them. And the next thing, pardon, Blue, Blue Ocean film. Yeah, I mean, and for the creation of Blue Ocean. And the, the job you have been doing, you know, is wonderful. And I should call you a bionic lady. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> bionic lady. Yeah, and uh, most in interestingly, you know, uh, here there are Fulbright scholars from more than 50 countries. And as Malala said, the Peace Nobel winner, you know, she said, one pen, one book, one teacher can change this world. So we should take a message like, if Dr. Sylvia, by her efforts, can change, make a difference, why people, so many people here, you know, especially the Fulbright scholars from more than 50 countries, if they take this message to their home, why we are not making advocacy to making better policies, if we educate people, first of all, then they can demand their rights. Every person got, you know, right for existence. So if we disrupt the ocean, if we disrupt the mother nature, obviously the money which we are getting, you know, by poisoning the water, by poisoning the environment, we are going to kill our future generations. So it, the, the message should be, you know, uh, th this is sort of my comment, and that the film, you know, should be uh, sort of, you know, shown in, uh, should be shared in social media, and uh, I appreciate if it will be, you know, provided or included in uh, secondary school, high school, environmental science departments. It will be great. Thank you. Thank you. Here, here. Hello. It seems like there's, there's really no doubt in the various um, scientific disciplines, marine sciences, terrest all the various terrestrial and atmospheric sciences about the whole issue of, of climate change. So with all of those scientific disciplines agreeing to that, and all the various environmental and conservation organizations in this country, and the various hunting and fishing groups, you would think that we would be able to build a critical mass by getting all of those organizations together and really being able to force some really serious action on this. Because there's a lot of talk among the various groups, but really the action just, it's coming in, in trickles when it needs to come in a big way. Do you all have any ideas about how maybe that could be brought more into fruition and really expedited by getting these various groups united? That's a question of all questions. I think you have identified the reality that many people care and they align with one organization or another, but they go, if they could be pulled together and work in concert, the power could be much more effectively deployed. That's, I suppose, where leaders come in who can bring those many interests that do have common elements. Teddy Roosevelt was a leader in his time who had power. That also helps. <laughs> uh, against some who didn't agree with the idea that it was important to establish national parks. But he used his wily ways within the framework of what he could do as president to establish what we now know and love as national parks, a system of national parks. There were parks before them, but there were scattered here and there. They hadn't been pulled together in a conceptual way about a system of national parks that now is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary, 2016. And there, you pointed out there are elements like conservation organizations, science organizations, policy organizations, with some common elements that the world is in trouble, the natural world. They see that a sound economy and a sound e environment are absolutely joined. You can't have a sound economy without a sound environment. You destroy the environment, the economy falls apart. And if people are hungry and don't have a place to sleep and so on, their economy is in trouble. 
they'll eat anything. They'll, you know, fight with one another just to have a place to be. So it's, you have to have both together. So each of you think about, I mean, you can make a difference in pulling together in ways that you, music is a great way to inspire people that cuts across all disciplines in a way that, that makes you, you know, believe in positive actions. Uh, so I'm not a musician. I can't do that. <laughs> but there are other ways that, that I try to use the power that I have. President Nasheed certainly has used his influence and power. I mean, what a cool idea, having a cabinet meeting underwater, capturing the imagination of people across the board who n didn't even know where the Maldive Islands were, but were inspired by the action of an individual with creative thinking who made people aware in a stroke of the, of the issues. It's that kind of genius of, in this case, it was about climate change and about the danger that his island country and people faced because of actions that were taking place half a world away, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, warming the planet, melting the ice, causing sea level to rise, now ocean acidification. But individual actions bringing attention across many barriers. I, I think about Jim Toomey, who writes Sherman's Lagoon, who uses humor to cause people of, across the board, many disciplines, to laugh at our idiocy to think of ourselves, to see ourselves reflected in the eyes of creatures who live in the sea. And, you know, there are, every person in this room, outside this room, every human being has something special going for him or her. The real trick is to use that power to light in people of different disciplines, different ideas, different faiths, to have, find the common ground. You can do it. President Nasheed is doing it, has done it. It's an example. What, what can you do? That's the answer. Hold up the mirror and see what you can do to actually take action while, while you can. Make that an objective. Figure it out. What clever thing can you do that will make a difference? So, um, actually, we don't control the mics. Ah. <laughs> well, I was hoping you would just point and say you. Um, as somebody who did study political science um, and came out of it trying to understand how different groups talk to each other and how different groups could come together and uh, achieve great things, you look at... Um, something such as the People's Climate March. And yeah. I was wondering if you could speak to the successes of that, and where do we go from there with that type of momentum? For the Climate March, I was in New York and was witness to that powerful turnout of people across disciplines, kids, you know, businessmen and women, um, I don't know, just a cross-section of humanity, but all joined together with a common concern and using, you know, one step at a time, <laughs> marching, walking, uh, talking, singing, waving their arms, whatever it is to say, look, world, we have a problem. What are we going to do about it? We care. I, I'm surprised, actually, that given that massive turnout that it wasn't, more con conspicuously featured in the press around the world, or even in the United States, or even in New York City, because it was a powerful moment. And I think that persistence is the answer there. You don't just stop with one, <laughs> one march. You keep marching and marching, and not just doing that, but follow up. Uh, I love what Louis Sohoyas did with his power as a filmmaker, 
with images that he got permission to use the United Nations as a screen, the buildings. And that during that same week, uh, in a special event, just had this powerful message or series of messages about climate change showing the images of what's happening to the ice, what's happening to shorelines everywhere, what's happening to the creatures who are being affected, including human creatures. And, you know, it's one thing and then another thing and then another thing and, you know, a tidal wave is made up of individual drops. We have to think about how we can, you know, move that wave. Um, Go ahead, please. Um, if I may, we ha <clears throat> I think we have, um, in, in, during the last 300 years or so, um, compartmentalized ideology and politics to right wing and left wing. <clears throat> and we identify ourselves in that frame. And we tend to elect people based on where we think we stand or where we think we were born. Uh, you're born a left winger or um, a, a right wing politician. But I am, I call myself a center right politician. Um, uh, and I call myself a conservative politician. And I, in my mind, there's nothing more important that a conservative politician should do than conserving the planet. Uh, uh, I, I think, uh, um, in answer to your question, um, perhaps we might, we must now try and deconstruct in a sense or uh, take apart this political ideology, the left and the right. And there are many people in the right who want to conserve the planet. There are many people in the left who doesn't want to do that. Um, so perhaps uh, we must move to this new pluralism, not necessarily based on um, economics alone, on where you stand in your ideology, uh, but based um, on other things as well. So I think uh, um, we must uh, try and see if we can move to this kind of idea. Um, in a sense, I think I'm talking about uh, uh, dismantling the existing political landscape and ideology uh, uh, so that you know, we have uh, other views in politics as well and don't uh, um, uh, compartmentalize yourself because you have a right wing or a left wing ideology. I left the left uh, because I was tortured twice in the name of society. And I felt that defending the individual was far more important um, than defending society because I, I had suffered um, in the name of society. Um, every time this was done to me, I was told that uh, this is for the good of society, uh, that the individual is suffering. So I, I hope that I've confused you more. <laughs> Taking care of the planet that keeps you alive should be a nonpartisan issue. Huh. It is. <laughs> Lisa, just I think okay. we're going to take one more. I'm I'm standing okay. in for Debbie. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I okay. okay. Well, I two more questions, but um, we I'm standing in for Debbie. Sorry, and we need to uh, wrap things up in about the next five minutes. So, okay. go ahead. I would like to say, Mr. President, you had mentioned at the very beginning that everybody here is believers. I came here not knowing absolutely anything. I came here because it was a loof, it was a film festival. I moved to St. Pete to get involved in the arts. It has to do with the ocean. I love the ocean. I grew up on an island. This is a great place to volunteer and come to learn. On Tuesday, I went to the movie theater. The first movie I saw was Shark Girl. I, walked I went home that night with a knot in my stomach. 
And after that, I saw a few movies. Um, last night was a highlight of this whole thing for me. I have an internet radio station I started here three years ago in order to be able to share voices. I come from the technology background. I'm not a scientist by far. However, I'm trying to figure out after all I've learned this, year, this week, it has changed my perspective on everything. I am the grandmother of six um, kids. And, and when you hear about climate war um, global warming, you know, I used to think, well, okay, I don't use hairspray anymore, so that's my contribution to global warming. You feel like there's not much that you can do. Um, those are the things to do. So I've been trying to think on how I can break down barriers in order to build coral reefs. And the question that I have is if by any chance you would know of any organizations, because my goal is to create these bridges where we can share a voice to help the people on, that are not involved in this on a day to day, to help the people that are struggling to be able to pay their bills and to, to you know, get food on their table that are not paying attention to these issues because they don't feel that they're that important. I have just been brought to my attention the fact that it could be in 20 years, 15 years, it's not 100 years away. So it's bringing that visibility. I know that I moved to St. Petersburg, I was able to go to the Chamber of Commerce, and through the Chamber of Commerce, I meet people and I move on from there. I'm just trying to see it the same way that people are asking about books, if by any chance you know of any organizations or any places we can go to try to create some more of camaraderie that we can unite and share a common voice for people on the street level. Right here in this area, Tampa Bay Watch, is small but really powerful and it's local and it's grassroots. It's one you should check out. I have a lot of time for them. Um, and if you don't see, if you, you, you can go down a list and there are dozens, even hundreds of organizations that are doing really good things, thousands perhaps around the world. Check them out, align with them, and if you don't like what you see, start one. <laughs> I mean, you think, well, there are enough out there already, but sometimes you know, you may have a perspective that others are waiting for somebody to articulate it, that they can join in with. Mission Blue, we try to connect people with people, with organizations. Uh, I'm not suggesting that this is the way to go, but you can there find the nearly 100 partners that Mission Blue works with, and, and they're listed in what, some of what they do, and we try to celebrate what they do. Uh, right here in Florida, there are a number that are really, really rocking. <laughs> the, the, and around the country, around the world. I, I love the International Union for the Conservation of Nature because that represents um, about a thousand conservation organizations globally and more than a hundred government representatives involved. It's an organization that's been around for many decades, based in Switzerland. Check them out. They have hundreds, or well, again, literally thousands of scientists who work with them, but also working with policy. And next week I'll be in Australia with the World Parks Congress that will draw nations from around the world under the umbrella of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. This meeting happens every 10 years. Last time it was in Durban. 2004, when the mighty tsunami and took uh, a lot of caused problems in your country. Um, so you know, there, use the internet as as a great source of <laughs> information, but then make some choices, find some soulmates, and align with them. Um, I have a small suggestion. Um, do you have a Twitter account? Start following one of the politicians that you don't like. <laughs> That's a great hitting. idea. <laughs> um, and then keep re retweeting her, and then keep hitting the other politician. It really gets us. <laughs> it really does, you know, because it comes right into you. And, and you're checking it. You're reading it. Uh, so I think, you know, get hold of a few bad politicians, a few people that you don't like. Um, <laughs> then uh, um, just keep on hitting at them. 
great idea. Yes. <laughs> Everybody can do that. Last question. First of all, I'd like to thank you both for being such an inspiration to all of us and to the world. And um, I have a, an observation and an, a question for you. I'm, I'm an attorney, and I've been working on environmental issues for my entire career. And in my experience, most of the time, the argument has been framed of the economy versus the environment, which we all know is a false dichotomy, that the costs of pollution have just been externalized, and that, of course, eventually will run out of resources, and then there will be no economy based upon them. But that old dichotomy was used very effectively by business to promote anti-environmentalist agenda. What I've noticed, I just came last week from a conference on impact investing, which was so eye-opening to me. The big investment firms, the Morgan Stanleys of the world, are now promoting to their very wealthy clients and to average investors as well, investments in environmentally and socially positive funds and individual companies. And the amazing thing is that these large investment firms are proclaiming that these socially and environmentally positive investments are actually outperforming their other funds. So what's amazing to me is that after, you know, hearing this debate, this, this false thing of environment versus the economy and people versus the economy, that now the large investment firms have spun around 180 degrees and are promoting sustainable investment as not just something that you do out of the goodness of your heart, but you people that want to make some money, invest in these funds. Lisa, can I just interrupt? Any full scholars, this is the time you need to leave because um, otherwise you're going to miss your... Transportation, I think, yes. Please. <clears throat> I was hoping so you would... now all the smart please, people are leaving the room? <laughs> uh, uh, please, please get to the question. Okay. Though. Please, so, thank you. Yes. So my question is, do you have an opinion on why suddenly now these investment firms, these people that are concerned in um, returns for their clients, have come around? Um. Yeah, um, I think it's, um, um, it's because uh, you are a Fulbright scholar. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, why the investment firms are now uh, switching to green economics is simply because it's more economically viable. It's reality. It's, it, it is becoming far more economically. Um, the cost of solar modules have come down by 80% uh, in the last two years. In the Maldives, producing a single unit of electricity by fossil fuel is costing us 23 cents. And now solar, I was told by a gentleman who is selling panels, uh, is costing about 13, 14 cents. So, uh, I mean, you'll be mad to do that if you can <coughs> produce electricity at uh, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 12, 13 cents, then you'll be mad to produce it at 23 cents. So we will not uh, buy any more internal combustion engines, but we would try and buy more panels uh, and then uh, I think it would only take. <coughs> very sorry. <coughs> it would only take a few more years for us to come up with um, electricity storage um, in the form of batteries. Uh, uh, Panasonic is, uh, and, and many many other battery companies have got into the act. So we are on the brink. We really are on the brink of a big change. And if you want to be the leader of tomorrow, you must embrace the future. Uh, 
uh, I was fortunate to go to a conference in Japan um, last month. It was full of um, lawyers, um, International Bar Association um, Annual Conference, and they had a paper on climate justice. Uh, uh, because they were, you know, it, it's a human rights is issue as well. Uh, so I think uh, uh, it, is, it is happening, uh, and, and we are going to win it. Woohoo! <laughs> I have some water. Thank you, everyone. Um, any farewells from either of you? Sorry? Just, do you have a far farewell statement you would like to make? <laughs> I, think, I think we should all go dive in the Maldives. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I think it's a good idea. <laughs> but she was saying, Sylvia was saying last night that she, she did 22, 25 meters skin diving, which is without cylinders. Um, I was when I was only when I was 18 and 19. I was only able to do 17 meters. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, and 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 uh, you know, uh, um, she does 25. That's very very deep. <laughs> not deep enough. <laughs> we need submarines. I want to I want to see the bottom, not just the tops of your mountains. The Maldives are you know these wonderful peaks where people live on the tops. But what's down there? Woohoo! <laughs> Let's go find out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> I I think with All that right. we need to get get upstairs and get changed for the awards ceremony. <laughs> thank you very much, both of you, and thank you for coming. Thank you.